the people of Singapore would like to choose their president, not a walkover. We have breaking news out of Singapore. It now has a third presidential hopeful. GIC is a former the chief, chief investment, investment officer, Ern Kok Song. The thought kept ringing in my head. Why not you, Kok Song? Why not you? Mr Ng has over 40 years experience in managing investments. Most of my personal friends advise me not to. When you are standing for president, you become everybody's business. 45-year-old fiancé, Sybil Lau. There will be an intrusion into our private life. She's got more money than me. My fiancé told me that I had been certified eligible to stand for president. The day our administration becomes corrupt, incompetent, we lose the treasure. I think he made a good president. He has all the, the qualities. I would like to be known as the meditating president. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was my best student. The best days for Singapore are ahead of us. Make a good government better. Why should young voters vote for you? Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Political Prude, the podcast. I'm so happy to welcome our next guest onto this show, Mr. Ng Kok Song, who announced his intention to run for presidency in July alongside his campaign slogan, United for Our Future. Mr. Ng was the former Chief Investment Officer of Singapore's Sovereign Wealth Fund, GIC, and is currently the Executive Chairman for Avenda Investment Management. Now, I think Mr. Ng is someone who was relatively unknown to the public up till recently. So I'm actually really excited to sit down with him, have that conversation and get to know him better and how he thinks as well. I also heard that he was friends with the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And if I'm being honest, he gives me major LKY vibes. So I do want to ask him about that relationship that they shared. Now, in the next one hour, we'll dive into his expertise in money management since he's such a finance guy and also find out what his plans are for the presidency if he gets elected. Lastly, we'll also ask him why he should get your vote. As always, before we jump into today's episode, we will really, really appreciate it if you can hit that subscribe button and also give this video a thumbs up. Now, a lot of hard work has been put into bringing you these past few episodes and a little love will go a long way. Now, without further ado, let's jump into the conversation. Hello, Mr. Ng Kok Song. Welcome to Political Prude, the podcast. Thank you very much for having me, Joel. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. And uh, before today's recording, actually, uh, we found out that you were one of the three presidential hopefuls who then got the uh, certificates of eligibility awarded to them. So congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I was very relieved <laughs> to hear that I have been certified eligible. How did, how did they tell you? Like, was it um, via email, a text, a call? I'm so capable. No, I want to know. Is, uh, they were very kind. They sent me uh, an official uh, confirmation by email with a, with a letter attached to it. Mm -hmm. And then they phoned me up. And was Sybil the first person that you spoke to? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. She how did she so react? Huh? How did she react? She was quite relieved as well because you, you were never quite sure, you know, about this. And so we said, good. Now we move on to the next stage, you know. Uh, step number three, you know. Indeed. Yeah. So when you're looking at the um, the landscape of this election, right? I mean, obviously before today, it was four presidential hopefuls that yes. have been campaigning and today we find out that it's three. Yes. Um, what is, where's your headspace at? Like, are you more relieved that there's one less competitor to go against now or are you, um, I don't know, like how, how, how else are you thinking about it? Well, I think it's good. My, my, my primary concern when I came forward was that we should have an election. Mm not a walkover. Uh, that was the main reason why I came forward. And so now there is an election. So I have uh, made my contribution to ensure that there was an election. Uh, when I first uh, came forward, there was only one other candidate, George Go, because mm -hmm. Taman had as automatically qualified. So I was really quite concerned, Joel, that George Goh might be disqualified. Mm. And if he was disqualified, then it's a walkover, which is not what the people of Singapore want. The people of Singapore would like to choose their president. They want to vote. So now, as it turned out, uh, Mr. George Goh, sadly speaking, was not qualified. So I didn't know that Mr. Tan Kin Lian was going to come in. 
Well, I, I don't think anybody knew actually. It came as a surprise That's for everyone. Right. Yeah. But I think the most important thing is that we now have an election. Mm. And you might say I contributed to make sure that we have an election. Indeed, yeah. So I'm, I'm very happy. In, a, in other words, whoever wins, the people of Singapore has won. That's very true. That's very right. true. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I think... Uh, on behalf of a lot of young people, we want to thank you guys for giving us a public holiday as well. Woo! Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. We, the more public holidays we have, the better. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to revisit when you first decided to say, okay, I want to run for presidency. You yes. know, So back then, um, it was about a month after Mr. George Go announced his intention. It was some time between the two of you. Yes. Why did it take you um, about four weeks to make that decision? You know, it's a very difficult decision to make all right so you i want to have more time to deliberate uh, on it um that's why it took me you know a month um so i think the um, there was a sequence of events that contributed to my uh, decision uh, the first uh, event was that i had participated in a series of interviews about Singapore's reserves mm. because of my long experience in helping to build up the reserves and invest the reserves. And I felt after the interviews that we have not sufficiently explained to the people of Singapore what is the meaning of the reserves and how does the president safeguard the reserves. Thankfully, now the prime minister has explained. Mm. All right. So I felt that I was one of the few people in Singapore because of my long experience of work in the GIC who understood and can explain to the people of Singapore. So that was the first thing on my mind. Then the second thing was I also participated in another documentary to commemorate the 100th birthday of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Mm. And when I finished recording for those for the documentary, I just felt a great sense of uh, gratitude for what Mr. Lee had done for Singapore and what he did for me. Yeah. My personal life. Because how could I, as a poor kampong boy, become the chief investment officer of GIC? So I was just wondering what can I do to, to honor Mr. Lee and to thank the people of Singapore for this opportunity to stand for the presidency. So those were the two uh, events. And then the third event was um, when Mr. Taman announced that he was going to stand for presidency. And he felt that it would be better for him to be elected because he can then say, I was chosen by the people, I have a mandate from the people. So when Mr. Taman said that, the thought kept ringing in my head why not you, Kok Song? Why not you? Hmm? So those were the three events that led to my decision. And then I had to, I consulted my close personal friends. I also consulted some of my contemporaries uh, in the public sector and some business friends. And most of my personal friends advised me not to because they felt it will involve a great deal of sacrifice you know, at my age, they say, I say, you've done enough, you know. But some of my other friends, you know, uh, public sector friends and also my business friends, they say, so if you feel strongly that you're doing something important and good for the people of Singapore, go forward and offer yourselves. Then the final person that I consulted was Sybil because I realized that once I offer myself for election, our private lives will be examined. There will be an intrusion into our private life. And since Sybil is my fiance, I didn't want to go into this without her support. Well, Sybil didn't take long. She thought about it for a while. And she says, Kok Song, if you really want to do this and you want to serve the people of Singapore, I'm prepared to make this sacrifice and I will support you totally. Nice. Thank you so much for sharing, Mr. Ang. Yeah. So 
a lot to uh, unpack there. So I want to talk to you first about your role in GIC, right? Yes. Um, a lot of people would, when it comes to the average person, you know, they would know, of course, Ministry of Finance or even the CPF board. But not a lot of people are familiar with the GIC and also then, of course, the, the, the role of CIO in in GIC. Yes. So my question to you is, what, what was your role uh, like in GIC and how does that help you make you a better president or help make you a suitable president? So first of all, keep in mind that the GIC is the manager, the investor of our reserves. All right? uh, there are three uh, reserve management entities, GIC, Temasek, and MAS. The GSE is the biggest, right? okay. the biggest one. So the GIC <clears throat> has a board of directors, which is uh, chaired by the Prime Minister. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew chaired the board for 30 years. You know, and after that, Mr. Lee Sen Lung, as Prime Minister, you know, took over the position. So we have a board of directors, and on the board of directors is the Deputy Prime Ministers, and Mr. Taman himself, was a deputy chairman on the board. The GSE has a chief executive and he also has a chief investment officer. Mm -hmm. All right. The chief executive is responsible for personnel policies and, and administrative things. But the chief investment officer is in charge of investments. Mm -hmm. You see? So in my role, I had the responsibility of recommending to the board investment policies an investment strategy, the, the key uh, strategies, such as how much risk we should take, how much should we put into stocks, into bonds, into private equity, into real estate, and how much you know, we should have in terms of our exposure to different currencies. These are the top-down decisions, but these are the decisions which have got the greatest impact on the bottom line. Mm. Right? So my job was to recommend to the board of directors what our key investment strategies should be. I have to persuade them, and if they approve, I have to execute the strategies. So best way for me to describe it is that if you compare myself with Taman, for example, you could say he's the policy maker, I'm the one who helped to formulate the policies, and I have to execute the policies. Mm -hmm. So both are equally important. Uh, the policy maker and the money maker. Right. Uh, <laughs> now, how does that how does that responsibilities then help you make 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 you a suitable president then? Yes, because the 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 president's critical role is what we call safeguarding the reserves. Safeguarding the reserves means when the government wants to draw down, wants to use our accumulated reserves, the government has to go to the president to get the president's approval, you know? So the president has got to make an assessment. Why are you asking for the money? You know, what is the emergency? What is the crisis, you know, that makes you come forward to ask for my permission? And why are you asking for so much? So in other words, the president must be able to make an assessment of the the environment. Mm? So, for example, during the uh, the COVID pandemic, twenty twenty, right? The president has got to assess how serious is the situation, how bad can it get, how can the Singapore economy be affected by the global economy, how long will the crisis last? So, all those uh, things must be understood if the president is going to agree or disagree with the government. So my work in the GIC was about understanding the global environment, understanding financial crisis, economic crisis, because I have taken the GIC through several major crises in my time there. So the knowledge and the expertise and the experience, actual experience, I think equips me to have the domain knowledge and expertise to assess any request from the government. Now, Mr. Ng, we, we know for a fact that, you know, if when it comes to 
managing the reserves, you your scorecard is like A plus, right? But when we when we think of the president, there are other yeah. aspects to the role, mm-hmm. right? Uh, for example, President Lima was very involved in community uh, and also championed, you know, like social mobility and things like that. If you were to be elected, what would be some of your key focus areas uh, when it comes to the community? I think the first thing that the president should focus on is to keep the, Singap- the people of Singapore united. In other words, we should enhance and even strengthen the uh, sense of unity of the people, all right? Regardless of their political views, you know, regardless of race, language, religion, you know? So the unifying role of the president is very, very important, all right? Now, then in addition to that, there are certain things that the president, you know, uh, can, can support, right? The president do not have the power to make policies. It's the government's job to do it. But the president can influence and the president can be a voice for certain things that he or she thinks is important for Singapore. So in my case, I have thought about it and I felt that I want to give special emphasis to the younger generation. Hmm? Because I feel that our younger generation it's our future, all right? And I feel also that our younger generation is a bit anxious about the future, you know? So I want to be able to inspire uh, hope and optimism in them. And then I want to see what I can do, you know, to, to help them prepare for the future. So I've identified three particular areas, right? The first area is to help our younger people become less stressed to have please <laughs> yes yeah to have to have more emotional resilience mm-hmm. all right second thing is to help our young people have more self confidence and i think one way is to help them to acquire better communication skills to have more confidence in public speaking you know like you you know so the, because if they can do that, that will make them be able to express their views, to be able to communicate their views, and particularly for leadership positions. Unless you speak clearly, how do people know your views, right? And then the third area is financial literacy, right? More, I find that most of the young people in Singapore do not know the basic elements of of financial planning, all right? Something simple as how do you buy insurance policy? You know, how do you assess what you need and whether the insurance agent is selling you something that you need? So these are basic skills which I think are not sufficiently addressed in our education system. Our education system puts emphasis on academic excellence or technical skills. But the three things that I'm talking about are life skills. Life skills on how to live a happier and better life, all right? And I feel that if I can do that, you know, um, it will make a difference uh, to to the young people. And when our young people are happy, their parents and grandparents will also be happy. Mm. So helping the young people is helping everybody to be happier. That will be my special focus. Got it. So, I think among the three, I'm struggling with two actually: the yes. the stress and the the money one. So, oh my goodness, you're actually so right when it comes to some of the the concerns of the young people. Yes. But let's zoom in on stress, right? And I know that um yes. you are huge on meditation. Yes. I I have a confession to make because I hear. I mean, I listen to podcasts and I hear all these, you know. Uh, wellness gurus, coaches, always saying that meditation is so important. Yes, I've tried it. You know, I've downloaded the Headspace app. I've listened to Calm. Even when they got Harry Styles onto the Calm app, I'm like, slay, slay, I'll try it out. Never worked. Never yes. worked. Yeah. Um, I know that you've you've taught people how to meditate. So, what was what are some of the tips that you can share when it comes to meditation for people like me who yes. are struggling with it? Sure. 
So I think there are three important things that I can share with you. The first thing is to understand that meditation is simple. Simple to do. Because what you have to do is to learn to sit still and learn to come to mental stillness. Okay. Right? And sit still is quite easy. I think you're sitting still now. Mm -hmm. But to come to mental stillness, you have to learn to concentrate. And therefore, I recommend using a mantra, a okay. word okay. that I sound, you know, quietly. And then I listen to the word. So by using the mantra and listening to it, I can let go of all the other thoughts that are constantly challenging me. But it's not easy because your mind is so agitated, one thought after another. So you need to practice. But it's simple, right? Sit still, say the mantra, right? Okay. That's all there is to it. Simple, but is it easy? No. No. Why not easy? Two problems. First problem, I like to meditate like you, but I got no time, mm. all right? So, no time, you have to find the time, all right? Maybe don't be too ambitious. Start with 10 minutes once a day. Ah, that is possible, all right? Now, I meditate now after 35 years. 25 minutes in the morning, 25 minutes in the evening. But when you first start, be realistic, all right? 10 minutes once a day, mm -hmm. all right? Now, why should you devote the time? because it will make you a better person. Meditation, in my opinion, is the kindest thing that you can do for yourself. Because when you become less stressed, you become a more peaceful person, you benefit, everybody else benefit. All your colleagues here will benefit. So in other words, it is simple, but not easy. So what does that mean? That means it's a discipline. It's a discipline, all right? It's like, you know, why do you exercise? So that your body can be fit, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a discipline. Similarly, meditation is to your soul what exercise is to your body. In other words, you must be regular, all right? How regular? I say start with once a day, then if possible, twice a day, all right? So in other words, understand that it's a discipline, all right? Anything worthwhile in life needs a discipline, all right? And then the third problem, expectations. So you say, I'm not good at it. Nobody is good at it. Nobody is good at it. After 35 years of practice, sometimes when I sit down to meditate, for 25 minutes, like during the last few weeks because of election. <laughs> mm -hmm. 20, 25 minutes, 15 minutes, distraction. Thinking about podcast, thinking about <laughs> that. So it's not, it's not easy, but important thing is never give up. Just because you are not good at it, practice will make you better. Mm. But you will never be perfect. The human mind is very difficult to come to complete silence. So be careful not to be concerned about success. Mm -hmm. Don't measure it by success. How do you measure it? You measure it by asking yourselves after one year, two years, am I a more peaceful person? Okay. Am I improving? Improvement is important, but don't expect perfection. So those are the three. So if you like, after the elections, we can have a meditation group. Sure, I'm down. And Call I me will up. come and <laughs> help you. Okay. And then other people. So I would like to be known as the meditating president. Ooh, at the Istana? A session at the Istana? Maybe I'm not allowed to have it at the Istana, <laughs> but I can come out of the Istana. Can, can, can. Okay. <laughs> now, one of the people that you actually taught meditation to was the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Yes. Um, how was that experience like? Oh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was my best student. Really? Yes. Because I, I have taught meditation to 
hundreds, thousands of people. Okay. You know, and the the casualty rate is very high. Eighty mm. percent. <laughs> okay. You know, in other words, out of every ten, eight give up. Okay. I don't think it's because I was not good in teaching, <laughs> but they don't have the discipline. Okay. You see, but with Mister Lee, fantastic. Number one, he was very serious. Serious means he will practice, and he wants to learn. So he was very humble, right? So I taught him how to meditate, how to sit still, how to say the mantra, how to meditate every day. So whenever I'm talking to him, he's listening, and then he has a tape recorder. He records my discussion with him. Then he asks his secretary, "Please transcribe the discussion." Then he will read through it in order to understand it better. Then he will ask me some questions. So he was very serious. Huh? Some people say I'm interested, but they're not serious. Mm. But he was very serious. Secondly, after about ten sessions. I said I come here and meditate with Mr. Lee at the Istana. I don't know whether he's meditating on his own. <laughs> so one day I plucked up the courage and I said, Mr. Lee, when I'm not here with you, do you do meditation on your own? So he says, Kok Song, what's the point of learning if you don't practice? <laughs> Fair, yeah. So he says, I practice every day. So I said, Wow, you are a very disciplined man. You know what he said, Kok Song. If I am not a disciplined man, our country wouldn't be where it is today. You know, for I mean, as I'm listening to that, what I'm thinking about is for someone to be willing to open up and be vulnerable. Because it sounds like you have to be vulnerable with yes. yourself and with someone else there to bounce yes. ideas and conversations yes. with. How did you form that kind of relationship with him? Because, I mean, I I don't yes. even. I see him from afar, right? And I feel like, oh, he could be very intimidating a person, you know. Like, how do you then get to know him as an yeah, individual? Yeah, because he himself asked me to teach him. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't go to see Mister Lee. You must meditate. Right, right, right. He came to the conclusion that it was good to meditate, but he wanted to learn. You see, so I suppose it was because Mister Lee trusted me. Did you guys share a, a, a close relationship before well, starting? I was working right? with him for thirty years at the GIC. Mm. He was the chairman of the board, you know. So he got to know me from the time I was forty years old, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think I am so lucky that I earned his confidence and his trust. Mm. You know that he was prepared to, you might say, uh, be vulnerable. Mm. You know. So, so that's why I think it's very important when you want to help people, they must trust you. Yeah, they must trust you for sure. Yeah. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far, and we'll return to the conversation in just a bit. Now, we really appreciate it if you can hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and while you're at it, give us a thumbs up if you're liking what you're watching. And now, back to the conversation. Now, earlier on in the conversation, you you mentioned that one of the reasons that you wanted to run for presidency was to thank Mr. Lee, yes. and you mentioned that you know um, he gave you opportunities as a young kampong boy and then becoming the head of um, GIC, right? So, w- in what ways did he help you? Well, he gave me the opportunity. If there was no Lee Kuan Yew, there's no reserves. Mm. Okay, you know what I mean. He was the one who built Singapore. He was the one who lifted us up from third world to first. Mm. Without Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, no reserves. With reserves, he gave me the best job <laughs> I can think of. <laughs> that is the reason. Mm. Now, some people think that um, in today's world that we live in, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's leadership style may or may not fit. The, the way people yeah. think today. Yes. Um, when you first delivered your announcement, a lot of people, my friends, who were watching, they were like, hey, 
he gives me Lee Kuan Yew vibes, you know, like the 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 the, the vibes yeah. the same. So, do you think that um you will be able to resonate with today's world? I think one of the things that we must all learn, regardless of how old we are, how young we are, gratitude, mm. gratitude. All right. Without Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, we wouldn't have our standard of living. True. That we have now. So we must have gratitude. Now, of course, he was a very strict disciplinarian. All right. And some people say, well, as he grew older, he lost touch. Okay. You know. But, but the key thing was, he sacrificed his life for Singapore. Otherwise, why do several hundred thousand people line up in the streets in the rain? Yeah. To pay their respects to him when he died. You see, so he sacrificed his life for Singapore. He made us proud to be Singaporeans. All right. So forgive him. For you know, for the fact, so oh, he doesn't understand us. Yeah, it's not easy for somebody who is eighty years old, you know. But never, always remember the importance of gratitude mm. for someone who has sacrificed for you, in the same way as your parents and grandparents. Ah, they don't understand us. Same thing. Mm. You must still respect your parents, respect your grandparents, because they sacrifice. For you, so I would like Singaporeans, youngest, to have that, that attitude, uh, of of, to have the attitude of gratitude. <laughs> yeah, okay, actually, that rhymes. That's a good. That's a good uh, motto, yeah. actually. Yes. Now I you you spoke about family, and maybe I would like to now shift the conversation to a little bit more on your personal life, yes. just to get to know you a little bit better. Um, you said that you grew up in a, with humble beginnings. Can you tell me, you know, what was life back then, and what were some of the key lessons that you learned? Yes, I was, um, you know, I grew up in a family of five brothers and five sisters, eleven of us. So big. We were poor. My father was uh, in the fishing business, all right, and then he lost his job when I was a teenager. So life was a constant struggle, you know, to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. So much so that quite often, my mother has to go and borrow money from our neighbors, you know, to buy food. There was one particular occasion when I had to buy school books. We had no money, so mom had to go to the neighbors to borrow money for me to buy school books. She came home, and then with tears in her eyes. Says Cox Song, our neighbor has no more money to lend us. So when I saw the tears in my mom's eyes, I said to myself, I was twelve years old. I do not want to see my mother cry again. So I'm going to study hard, study as hard as I can. I'm going to work hard. I want to take my family out of poverty. Hmm. And then similarly, you know, later on when I was eighteen years old, my father lost his job. I was going to university, so my father says, "You cannot go to university. You have to go and work to support my our family." So I told my father, "I said I need to go to university. Otherwise, how can I lift the family out of poverty? But I will still support the family. I will work part time." So I gave private tuition mm. to many students. It was very tiring because I have to rush from university to give tuition and back, you know. But I, I took responsibility at a very young age for my family. So what does that teach me? It teach me what it's like to be poor. Mm. Number two, it teach me that I can do something. I can study hard. I can work hard. It teach me responsibility. I had the responsibility. So two things: what it's like to be poor, and taking responsibility for what you have to do. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing. Now, in one of the doorstop interviews that you did, 
you mentioned that mental health is the secret to Singapore's success when it comes to raising productivity. Yes. Um, can you elaborate why that is so? Yes. yes. Everybody is looking for happiness. Everyone. But sometimes we look for happiness in the wrong places. So we think that we can only be happy if we have a lot of money. We can only be happy if we are powerful, if people like me. All right? In other words, quite often we are conforming to the expectations of our parents, our teachers, our bosses, or our contemporaries. So especially social media is good for communication. But sometimes it causes a lot of stress among the younger generation because they're trying to keep up. They're trying to create a nice image of yourself. All right? But we all know that that's not the real you. <laughs> Life is not like that. Yeah. All right? So, so in other words, people cannot be themselves. Meditation helps because when you learn to meditate, you go to a place of peace and harmony within yourself. Because when you l meditate, you forget about yourself. You forget about your problems, your, your desires. You forget about people's opinion about you, what they think of you. So you go to this place of peace and harmony within you where you can be yourself and say, I am a unique human being. There's nobody else in the world like me. I'm unique. I'm not supposed to copy anyone. I'm a unique person. To know that and say, what am I called to be? I do have a question here about your relationship with Sybil. Yes. Um, so when you first collected the forms at the elections department, um, you spoke to the media about your relationship with your fiancé, Sybil. And I think the age gap between the two of you was one of the first few things that people picked up on. Yes. But from what I see in this conversation, you speak um, about her or, you know, you, you, you mention her with such love, right? So I, I'm actually quite curious about your love story. Like, how did you guys... Um, meet and also then how did you guys develop this relationship if you don't mind sharing well you know first the facts right? mm. so regarding Sybil she's lived in Singapore for 20 years mm. she's a Singapore citizen Okay. she gave up her Canadian citizenship to become a si Singapore citizen before I met her okay alright <laughs> uh, number two She's 45 years old. That means she's a mature mm. person, right? Who have experienced life, who has got certain values, right? Number three, she's an investment professional, right? So I think she's as good in investments as me. That's why we are able to be on the same wavelength and discuss investments as equals. Hmm? And number four, we don't want to talk about this, but she invests for her grandfather's foundation. Mm -hmm. She's got more money than me. <laughs> because some people say, oh, she's a China woman. She's a gold digger. She's not a China woman. She's a Singaporean, lived 20 years in Singapore. So I think these are facts. Mm. And normally we don't want to talk about all these things. Yeah. Because nobody's business. It is. Yeah. But when you are standing for president, you become everybody's business. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's a fact. Then me, I was married for 33 years to my late wife. We don't each other for 39 years because we met six years earlier in school. Patricia died of cancer 18 years ago. Hmm? I cared for her during her illness. 
She loved me so much that when she died, I told myself, Gok Song, you have experienced so much love from Patricia. It's enough to last you a lifetime. So I wasn't looking for another relationship. I was quite happy. I was not lonely because I had my children, grandchildren. I had my work to do in GIC, you know. But then 14 years after Patricia died, unexpectedly, Sybil walked into my life and I fell in love again. Those are the facts. All right. <clears throat> so how did we meet? <laughs> <laughs> so as I explained to you, Sybil is a, you know, an investment professional. And so she's always interested in learning about investments. So one day she was watching a, a podcast uh, where I was giving, uh, I was taking part in a discussion about investments okay. to the Yale University, mm. you know. So she, she saw that podcast and then she said to herself, I'd like to meet this guy. Uh, he, I might be able to learn something from him. So she mentioned this to a mutual friend of ours. So one day I was having lunch in Ju Chat. <laughs> and then my friend was having lunch. So he came over to me and says, Kok Song, uh, do you mind meeting a friend of mine? So I said, who is this person? She says, a lady called Sybil Lau, lives in Singapore. She's interested in investments. So at that time, I had just started my investment company after I retired from GIC. So I said, uh, uh, what does she do? She said, oh, she's an investment professional. She manages her grandfather's family foundation. So straight away, I said, maybe it's a potential client. <laughs> fair, fair thought. Yes, so, yes. So I said, hey, Chong, please bring her to see me. So I thought I'll make a business pitch. Mm. So anyway, Chong brought her to my office. I met her. I forgot about my business pitch <laughs> because I was distracted. Right. <laughs> that was how I met Sybil. And then we wanted to, I mean, we wanted to get married about two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. Then her mother died. Mm -hmm. Her mother died. Sorry to hear And that. it's quite customary, you know, yeah. for us to have a period of uh, respect. Yeah. You know? So we decided we will postpone our wedding for three years. Right. You know? And so that is why I'm standing for president, but <laughs> Sybil is my fiance. But after the election, whether I win or not, we're going to get married. <laughs> How fun. I can't wait to see the photos and everything. Hopefully, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to share some of the photos with the public as well. Because we're rooting for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I hope people of Singapore will understand. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and, <clears throat> and I myself feel that um, Sybil has got many wonderful qualities. So when people ask me, uh, what attracted you to Sybil? One of my best friends, you know, he, he says is BBC, Beauty, Brains, Character. Right, okay, okay. You see? Now, you have to ask Sybil yourself what she saw in me. <laughs> <laughs> I will definitely ask her. I want to know. Now I want to know. I'm looking for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, but thank you so much for sharing about, you know, your relationship. I think it's a beautiful one. Uh, Mr. Ng, I want to talk to you about George Yeo, not George Go, <laughs> because that's a, a name that, you know, a lot of people did associate with a possible uh, president uh, nomination or um, candidacy in the past. Uh, but this time around, he came forward to actually speak about you. Um, can you tell me more about how he became your character reference? When I decided to stand for the president, I wanted to inform my friend, uh, Josh Yu. So I went to his home to, uh, to pay him a personal visit. 
so that I can inform you not only of my decision, but the reasons why I was standing for president. And the reason was that I did not want to see a walkover. I said I would like to honour the office of the presidency to make sure that we have an election because it's about the elected presidency. So how can you say you have elected presidency when you don't have an election? Mm. So I, I explained to George that my main concern was that the credibility of the office of the president should be honoured and I felt that I would be honouring the presidency if I came forward so that there will be an election if I'm certified eligible. So once I explained to George, I said, um, would it be possible for you to help me in some way? So George thought about it for a while. And then he says, since he has known me for a long time, my work and me in a personal capacity, so the best way I can help you is to be your character reference. Uh, he says, I also know Taman. I have worked together with Taman. We were fellow cabinet ministers. So he says, if Taman asks me why I agree to be your character reference, I will say to Taman, if you, Taman, want me to be your character reference, I will do the same for you. <laughs> so I think those are quite significant words because it shows that George cared for what is the best interest of Singapore. Mm -hmm. I think he wanted to, to do what he can to ensure that we have a credible presidency. Um, <clears throat> And so it was um, a beautiful balance <laughs> that he struck. Mm. So, you know, the, the name Giorgio, he, he's still, I think to this day, still very beloved by a lot of Singaporeans. Do you think that having him as a character reference uh, gives you a boost in your campaign? So it's very uh, gratifying for me to know that uh, George understands my reasons for standing and I hope that uh, as my character reference, you know, uh, it will help me, help the people of Singapore to know me better. Got it. That's what a character reference means. Mm. Yeah. So I would like to talk to you about your presidential campaign itself. So your slogan, um, can you tell me more about it, please? United for our future. Mm -hmm. our future mm? I feel that the best days for Singapore are ahead of us optimism mm? and <clears throat> but in order to prepare for the future we have three treasures that makes Singapore exceptional why we succeeded since independence 58 years ago and why they will be important for the future. Three treasures. The first treasure, our reserves. Our reserves, as the Prime Minister explained, savings for a rainy day. In difficult times, we can fall back on our reserves. We can bounce back. We can be resilient. So we must safeguard our reserves. Second treasure is the treasure of good administration. Our government administration is respected all over the world. Makes Singapore work. And the president has an important role to play because the president can veto appointments to key public service appointments. That is a treasure. Right? The day our administration becomes corrupt, incompetent, we lose the treasure. Then the third treasure, a 
our social treasure. Our social treasure is the unity of our people. Hmm? We should all, you know, one Singapore, you know, and we all should stand together for Singapore. So that is something that the president has to help enhance because the president is the symbol of unity for all the people of Singapore, regardless of their race, language, religion, or political affiliation. So these are the three treasures that I think are very important, you know, for the president to, uh, uh, to, to, to safeguard. I just want to ask you very, very quickly, what does being united look like for you? United means um, loyalty. Okay. So what I like to see in Singapore is a good opposition. A good opposition, first of all, must be loyal to Singapore. Right? Mm -hmm. Loyal to Singapore. Number two, make a good government better. Mm. Without opposition, government becomes complacent. Good opposition keeps the government on its toes. Makes good government better. I think that is extremely important. My last question for you is, why should young voters vote for you? Because I will inspire hope and optimism for the future. Because I will make special efforts in those three areas. Emotional resilience, self-confidence, financial literacy. Those are specific things that I would like to do. So I would like young people to vote for me so that I can work together with you for a better Singapore. Beautifully said. And that's all the time we have, so we have to wrap up the conversation. But thank you so much, Mr. Ang. This was really like a beautiful conversation. I actually almost cried at one point. I was like trying to hold it and I was like, no, no, stop, stop. But yeah, I appreciated you um, taking your time out of your schedule uh, to do this conversation with us. Yeah, I'm so delighted. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, helping me to communicate you know, my message to the people of Singapore. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you. And with that, we've come to the end of yet another episode of Political Prude, the podcast. Now, I really enjoyed this discussion that I had with Mr. Ung. I think he's incredibly spirited, eloquent, and he does have a good track record. Now, this discussion definitely helped me get to know him better as a person and also his hopes for Singapore under his presidency, if he gets elected. Now, as always, I'll revisit this conversation in a later episode to give my thoughts on it. And that's it. Once again, I'd like to remind you to show us some love by clicking on that subscribe button. It would mean so much to us so that also you don't miss out on any of the episodes that are coming out. Now, if you found this episode good, do share it with your friends and family members too. I'll see you again in the next episode of Political Prude, the podcast. This was the Zoda Pop Podcast.